Welcome to the Product Design Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Coolen, founder of UX Cabin, where we create world-class web and mobile apps. I'm excited to bring you a behind-the-scenes look into the lives of some of the most interesting and talented people in product design. We'll get strategic advice on how they got to where they are today and things they wish they would have known earlier in their career. Hey, welcome to the Product Design Podcast. We've got Brent Palmer here with us today. He is the Product Design Manager at Mixpanel. He's also led teams at PayPal, Zendesk, and Fast. Brent, it's super good to have you here, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Seth. So, so happy to be here. Yeah, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you live and who you are? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Austin, Texas, native for about, gosh, 23 years now. It's been home for us for some time. Really kind of charted almost my entire career here in Texas. So you can call me a native Texan, if you will. Been doing the team lead manager in B2B SaaS for about nine years now. Really enjoyed coaching the team I have at Mixpanel, where we're helping folks learn from their customer data. I'm kind of an analytics junkie. So being able to kind of flex between qualitative research and quantitative stuff is really fun for me. It's kind of a I guess you need kind of approach to leadership and management. And uh, yeah, I think two dogs who may interrupt us here, but hopefully we can cut that take out and we can do it again. And uh, just thrilled to be kind of sharing and talking shop about product design and all things like leadership. So thanks. Cool. Very cool. So yeah, how did you even get started into the industry to begin with into UX and product design? Yeah, I love that question. So long story long, you know, I would spend days and hours in my room cartooning. I thought I was going to be the next like Gary Larson or Charles Schultz and, and illustration and cartooning was always fun for me. Translate that to what it looks like as a high school and university student that not really quite sure if that could translate to something like professionally right away. So I had like this really, I don't know, I went to the University of Texas here in Austin started off as economics and just that was something my parents wanted to do and I wasn't really into it. How could I kind of blend this kind of creative profession, this creative passion I have with something more in the professional arts I could, you know, bring home a paycheck. Found the advertising school and the creative segments at UT and just a light bulb came on for me. That was something that I could kind of take my, my like appreciation and love for like satire, graphic arts, illustration, things like that, and apply it to like the commercial sphere. So it was, an, it was a really cool blend. They showed me kind of the fundamentals of how to blend art and business. And that's kind of how I got into it. You know, for the first like half of my career, it was all digital marketing. Yeah. So I'm dating myself here. So, you know, emailed web banners and we're talking Flash, we're talking Dreamweaver, we're talking all of that. And I think, you know, as the game progressed, I know we moved towards something that was more like UX focused. Yeah. So it wasn't like, you know, we weren't this agency who was thinking of campaigns with all these different artifacts. We were moving closer towards like partnering with the their client more directly. So we'd workshop with them, we'd do some sketches with them, we'd whiteboard with them. It felt started to feel like UX as things kind of progressed towards like beyond just banners. It was like microsites and landing pages and things like that. Yeah, um, no, that's super cool. I kind of got my start in a, a digital marketing company as well, just doing similar stuff, but more a little bit more on the front end side. But tell me a little bit about kind of how you got your first, you know, lucky break getting into your first job and your first opportunity. How did that come along? And how did you find that first gig? Oh, my gosh. So I had an internship when I was in UT at a secure called Sekul Martin. And, you know, being an intern, you're at an agency, you're usually just flipping through like stock photo albums, trying to find stuff and doing research. But this one time I was asked to kind of pitch into some logo and branding brainstorming, I guess you would say. We did a bunch of cycles and we would just put them up on the wall and evaluate. And so I did a bunch of looking back on it now it was kind of silly. It was kind of a textured pattern. Basically, I just drew a bunch of blobs. And I think like now an AI program can do all that for you and like minutes but this took me days to find like and just draw out and shape like the perfect blobs and we put all the logos up on the wall and to have like the creative director come over and you know 
put the hand over the mouth and kind of look at it in consternation and, and kind of think and really give it some rigor. And hmm, that was kind of a moment for me. I was like, well, maybe, maybe I need to learn more and <laughs> keep going with this pursuit. But it was a real nice moment to kind of be included in the broader group where, you know, I had the eye and ear of the creative director there. That was my first kind of opportunity to be really coached by a great creative director and kind of move more into that space. Very cool. So was this just something through school that you were able to get? Or did you just kind of meet someone outside of school who was looking for what you did? Oh, Seth, my memory's really fuzzy. It was through a mutual connection, Kevin, Kevin Greenblatt, who who got me in the door. It's Cole Martin. And, you know, even internships back then were, you know, you physical portfolios and they're probably the size of this desk, you know, where you, you unzip it and you open it up and they're, you know, they're covered in plastic sheets and literally like printouts of <laughs> websites and advertisements and emails that you're looking at the printed version of these kind of digital artifacts. It's really kind of archaic, but yeah, that's how I got in the door. Wow. No, that's cool. I think, you know, obviously it's always the hardest thing just to kind of get that first springboard into the career. It's like, how do you get noticed? How do you get that first job? Maybe it's a freelance job. Maybe it's a contract gig. Maybe it's an internship. Maybe it's, you know, an entry level job, but, you know, thinking about back then to, to now, obviously the differences, but be curious if you have any insight or advice to people who are looking to land that first gig or that first lucky break now as they're coming of age in their UX or product design career? Excellent question. Well, I was fortunate enough to use an alumni network at my college university. I think of an analog might be something like a art school alumni group or any UX academy alumni network that can help kind of make intros. I think in the end, it's great to hustle and have an online portfolio, but I think your network speaks volumes. I think one of your previous guests mentioned something about the power of networks or yeah, who knows you or something like that. I think through self-reflection and discovery, like where you want to work and discovering what's important to you is really important. So that's a list of a handful of companies and a network of people who you can potentially reach out to. And I think just human to human is still the best way to get your foot in the door or your portfolio or resume at the top of the stack. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about that before in other episodes of just like using a back door, you know, not going in the front way of just applying online or whatever, but having someone vouch for you or make a, a warm intro is, is most of the time going to get you to the top of the stack. So as long as your portfolio is passable, I would put more effort into the personal network side of things as well to try to get a foot in the door that way. Exactly. I, I would even add platforms like ADP List and others who create a network. There's a network inherently embedded there where it's around coaching and around mentorship. That's the centrality of platforms. And then from there, you know, there's job boards that, and opportunities that come spring out of that. And I think that's been really helpful to me on both sides, both as a hiring manager and a candidate is I'm in a platform having conversations about process and approach. And I know what it's like to work with you through particular kind of organizational issues or organizational problems, or if there's an interview prep or, you know, or it's as simple as that, you know, parts, some of my sessions are around interview preparation and portfolio mock interviews, basically. Sure. And you kind of get in these reps and you get kind of do these experiments with people who aren't hiring. So there's pressures off, no table stakes. You're already kind of developing a relationship, personal one with people who you admire and are people who you've identified like in your network. That person that you reach out to may not be at the company or role that you want right now, but those types of managers and mentors, they move elsewhere. They don't stay at that place forever. And I think those relationships are more of a premium or I'd prioritize those relationships over like just banging on the door of a particular company. So if you, if you know a hiring manager or someone who does great work at a, a company or agency that you really admire, you know, buy them a coffee virtually. There's some online tools to do that. You know, ask them to coach you on something super easy, low risk, 
ask them to give you feedback on a case study. 30 minutes is worth, you know, two, three, four hundred applications, you know, that you might send into job posts. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, well, we can get to in a little bit kind of what you look for when you're interviewing, but maybe we go back a little bit to kind of the timeline of your career and kind of how you progressed and kind of found your niche more in the the leadership management side of things. Oh boy. Yeah. So kind of closing the chapter on the digital marketing era for me, doing some lead generation for credit card company, felt really icky, wanted to kind of get out of just kind of the visual design aspect and being an agency model to working in-house. I felt like my next area of development was being on the engineering side and working with products. So PayPal was building an office in Austin. I had no idea. They came knocking. And Scotty O'Matty was gracious enough to give me a role there as a lead. And that was my first foray into actually kind of people managing and really kind of this hybrid player coach of like leading slash managing a small team. And under his coaching and mentoring, really, his kind of tutelage, he was able to not only kind of help me through the transition of like, hey, you're in product now. This is kind of a different way of working. And oh, by the way, even though there are similarities in the way we kind of shape and direct work and shape and direct careers, it's a little bit different. Let me kind of give you some coaching and, and kind of work with you pretty directly on kind of how make that transition. So kudos to Scotty for helping with that. Most designers just aren't as fortunate to kind of have like mentor managers to help kind of bring you into like team leadership. So I'm really thankful for him. And it's been, that's kind of been the story of my product career really for the past eight years, a little bit of Bay area tech, a little bit of kind of agency, a little bit of scale up. It's a it, it growth and, and on my career is, is definitely not linear for sure. Yeah. Maybe we can talk a little bit of some of the highs and lows of your career since none of us have a linear process, but what are times that you look back and you say like, man, that was, that was a rough spot or needed to really change direction or change something in, in your past career? Yeah, man, that's a, that's a tough question to answer, Seth. I, I guess I'll be honest and say there was a period where both were combined. So when I took a role at overseas, I was kind of met with a bunch of challenges, very exciting opportunity to live and work in Europe. You know, if you're an American, it's kind of like winning the lottery. If you get, if you have a company kind of relocate, you move over there. On the other hand, there's also a kind of cultural barriers, language barriers, things like that. And I think the hardest part for me was, well, the best part was all the accoutrement that goes with being in a different country. You know, now you have a more worldly perspective you have more empathy for what it's like to be an immigrant, not being native to that country. You're developing new skills across cultures, how to communicate and then how to do work in a completely different context, which also means that doing work in this new context, you have to relearn a bunch of assumptions. And I think one of the hardest things for me was to learn, I, there was a little some scar tissue there from learning how to collaborate and work and lead French teams. I love French teams. The people I work with there were, were tremendous, extremely smart, kind people. One of the hardest parts for me there was to really kind of understand how decisions were made within a French organization. It's really kind of silly in me to kind of just trot in and roll out your just, you know, at, at first blush, here's like a really Bay Area kind of a way of working. Here's a design sprint. Here's a retrospective. Certain rituals and pieces of the process, like, here's how we make decisions in the open this way. That's certainly not historically like how French tech organization would make decisions like that. And, I, and you know, I don't want to paint like broad, broad strokes, but in my experience, in my story in France, that was certainly the case where modes like defaulting to being transparent or asynchronous or writing or collaborative where you, something as simple as like a design sprint where you're kind of putting work up on a wall and you're, dot voting and then like your affinity and your clustering that way like this consensus way of decision making when running a similar workshop and applying that same approach in the french team it was very difficult to kind of get collaboration and to get teams to express themselves to be opinionated about stuff in a setting where there were multiple layers of hierarchy so decisions there were more 
hierarchical driven and yeah. there's particular kind of process and way to kind of approach getting alignment on a team in one country versus like in the U S I won't get into specifics, but you know, I learned the hard way that cutting and pasting kind of a way of working was pretty ignorant of me. And I learned there was a lot to learn from the French team that I bring back now. Yeah. Working mixed panel. So that's really, that's really interesting. I remember just watching a video the other day about like this girl going through like eight different cultures in the way that they even just accept compliments. Like I don't remember specifically, but it was like some, some cultures, if you compliment someone, us, we kind of deflect and say like, oh, well, this was a cheap shirt. That's why I got it. And, you know, it just kind of fell into that opportunity and it's not really me that's, you know, just kind of deflecting and some cultures, if you compliment them on something, it's like polite to give you the thing that they, that you were just complimented on. Like, oh, you, you know, you like my pen. Well, here it is. Thank you for complimenting me here. You can have the thing or not believing you if you, if you give someone a compliment, cause that's just like not something you do in that culture or what have you. So, yeah. you know, it's just one thing and imagine like an entire work culture permeating everything about the day. That's probably feels so similar, but so different to, to what our context is, which is really, really insightful. Oh, a absolutely. You know, and then if you're in that country, you may be working locally in a smaller company, but if you're in a larger organization, you think about companies in Europe that have offices everywhere and you're dealing with, you know, customers all across Europe, even doing something as simple as user research and how you approach that was a huge learning experience for me. Trying to think about if I had to rewind the clock and, and give like one resource to myself before we moved over there, probably would have been Aaron Meyer's book, The Culture Map. I don't know if you've heard about that. Really great practical advice on how to do business globally and how to lead effectively or any kind of change management. Just do your job basically in a global context. Excellent resource. Very cool. We'll have to link that up in the show notes. But yeah, curious about at any point during this time, did you ever think like, maybe I don't want to be in the management or the leadership role. Maybe I just want to be an individual contributor or something else. Yeah, absolutely. Seth, there was one hypothesis I had, which was as middle manager or senior manager, you know, the one who's making the decisions on the product is the real leader is the real is the one who's designing the product and then necessarily the senior most design leader there. Right. And so one strategy I had was, well, what if I join a startup early as a contributor, someone in the principal level and build the foundation as well. So the design system is there. Some of the cadences and rituals of good design best practices are in place, kind of like working on the slab and the framing first, and you install that kind of offense or defense well, and you're helping the company scale and grow and the product scale and grow. And as that does, then you can begin to put, you know, the right siding on or the stonework or the roof. And then of over time, you're starting to grow the team. And so the culture evolves, right? So my hypothesis there was, could someone with many years of experience go back to being IC? And to some extent, I felt like that was a really valuable use of my time. Because what I, what I really learned was a lot of that DNA for doing good design starts at that level. It starts at the root. And I think that's why like Designer Fund, for example, are doing really good work. They're a great resource to early stage companies and startups that can imbue and you as well, right? You're partnering with businesses at a very early stage to make sure, you know, they're trying to be design forward and, and include design best practices and all the benefits of being designed forward into their business early on, right? It's very hard to unwind that later, which is what I was trying to test. And so that was a good year and a half. I came back to the States in 2019 and did something similar like that. I worked at a couple of startups that at a principal level can, did everything from marketing website, help docs, t-shirts and hats, product roadmap, all the stuff. And realized that it was really thrilling to be, you know, extremely hands-on and back there again. But I think over time, my heart was still bent towards investing in people over just contributing and doing the craft. So I miss leading teams. I miss managing, coaching people and wanted to transition out of being a principal IC back into management. So it's kind of a weird 
like I said, it's not really linear. I was managing leading small teams, took a gamble being a principal, like founding designer. And now here I am back at mixed panel leading a team again. So what did you miss about leading a team? Yeah. I mean, playing sports or, you know, know, being in a team setting, even as early as, you know, thinking about how we worked on projects and campaigns in an agency setting, right? Like you're, you're paired with a strategist, you're paired with a copywriter. There are creative people, like-minded people that you're collaborating with either in a physical space or virtually. And I miss that. I miss helping invest in people over many different cycles. And so helping them just evolve and helping them be more aware of themselves and leveling up their skills. Russell Airway has it best. I think he calls it like a moonshot or a slingshot where my energy comes from helping people launch pad. So, you know, you think about you going to the moon, or I think how he captures it is you're looking for a moon mission. You can't get to Mars. You're going to have to use the moon's orbit to kind of slingshot you out and to reach the planet. And I, I really hope that, you know, what gets me really excited is, you know, geez, I want the delta between when I first meet you and when you finish working with me, that delta between when you came in and when you left is really great. And that's where I kind of get a lot of my energy. And I miss that. And that's not something that I got from just pairing with other founders at startup level or even doing something like one hour on an ADP list mentorship. I really wanted to throw my whole body at the team and really be with them for the long haul. Nice. So uh, I'm sure you'll, you've learned and realized that different people have different ways they respond to leadership or management. Some people want to feel safe and comfortable and then they can do their best work. Some people need to feel a little bit of pressure or stress and able to do their best work. But I'm curious if you have any kind of just like off the top of your mind management tips and tricks to kind of get the best out of your team and help them flourish. Yeah, I'm always, I tried to lean in with curiosity. So I'm a big fan of what do they call it? Socratic management. Yeah. I'm asking questions so they can find the answers and steer to the answers themselves. So I, you know, is that scar tissue from maybe like an overbearing creative director early on? (laughs) Maybe micromanagement from, you know, not so good boss, probably, but I've seen really great bosses in my experience, in my career and their approach being very like, Hey, we're going to work on the best thing I can give you right now is the clarity. I can give you clarity around the problem and I'm going to almost like inception, you know, they had this weird way of moving me into a stretch zone that allowed me to figure this out. They knew the answer all along, Seth, but they let, they guided me through almost like some kind of, you know, issue and situational Sherpa where I could discover the path forward on my own. And that's something I just try to take with me and model that in my own kind of management practice. So, yeah, I think the best, you know, managers, well, I think like the prerequisite is like the manager kind of has to be good at doing the job initially because no one's going to respect you if you can't like actually do the work. Right. So you have to have kind of that proven True. track record of you can trust me and my, my advice I'm giving to you. Right. So if that, you know, if we can just get that out of the way, I think then it just becomes about like, how can this manager almost replicate or multiply their efforts? Because if they can only do so much, even if they were to go heads down and something, give all the answers, do all of the work. So then it becomes like, how can this person level up or replicate what their work would be across their team? So like, how can I make, you know, this, this lone junior, these lone group of, you know, junior or associate designers through my impact level up to be a mid or senior level just by pointing them in the right direction, asking them the right questions, giving them the right resources, breaking down the right walls for them. And that, in my opinion, is like the best sort of manager who can not just get the work done and, and, you know, get the sprint done on time, but it's like, how can you replicate yourself in, in all of these people simultaneously to just be, be a, a multiplier across the team? Yeah. You touched on a couple of great things there, Seth. One is trust is earned. So it's challenging to go in to any new context and impose, right? Like the first thing I try to do is just listen 
And earning trust can mean different things. What I've learned over the years for some designers, it's like, do, do you respect my, my experience in craftsmanship? Like, do, do I have the chops? Do you respect my chops? There's that. There's also earning trust by just listening and providing a space for them to do a potential, maybe like side project, get them involved or plug them into a community that's doing maybe nonprofit work. So it's, it's really about, Hey, again, I'm doing research and discovery on y'all as much as you're doing research and discovery on me. So I want to know what makes you tick, how to earn trust. Cause that, that is foundational to everything moving forward. That second bit you mentioned, I try to do, or I hope that most managers try to do is just to amplify the team around them. And what I mean by that is I view every designer I work with as a leader. Their sphere of influence may be a lot smaller. If you're a junior designer, your sphere of influence may be your other junior designers or your immediate kind of group or pod that you're working in. Um, but you're a leader at all levels. And so my job is to just progress you and to grow that, that sphere and all the people that around you that you may touch to influence and, and impact with your work. Totally. I guess another good question would be like, you know, you as a manager, obviously the hope is that you're bringing on people that work well with the team and who are energized, wanting to learn. Is there a way that you know, like if someone's not going to work out, like the telltale signs of this person's not a good fit or they're, you know, I'm not going to be able to get out of them what the team needs. Are there any pieces of advice you have for, for how to identify that? You know, one of my management philosophies is, you know, always be tinkering. And so I, what I'd want to do with anyone who maybe is currently on the team or what I'm thinking about, even in the interview process, will this person perform well? Or, you know, what are some of the potential yellow flags or follow-ups? It's usually a context switch to triangulate kind of the signal that I'm getting because I can't rely on myself. I've got so many biases. I need to create like telemetry around the person's ability and competency performing this role. I view that. And why do I do that? I view that as, as being a more inclusive manager and making sure that there are other perspectives and stories here around what is true that I need to kind of listen to. And so, for example, I might do this in an interview. I might or reorganize the follow-up interview panel a different way. For example, one of the things we might do is we might bring in a researcher and a designer to kind of walk through a discovery project this person might have done. We might bring a customer support person in to talk about how they speak to other team members and more kind of value-driven questions. And so based on the sequence of kind of interviews that we have, we might re-swizzle, that's a fancy word there, that's a Texas word, re-swizzle kind of how we operate on the front end of how we screen and interview candidates. The goal is trying to provide the most positive candidate experience possible. And then also, you know, we have to ask ourselves, can this person do the role at mixed panel? And those are some of the ways we kind of try and build out the telemetry and, and kind of check ourselves too, because it's such a flawed process, Seth. There's always like this patina or like veneer exchange that happens during an interview process. And since it's not perfect, we really want to make sure that we're building telemetry there. And when I think about how do I kind of level up and coach team members that exist that are currently on the team, I think about it's really changing the context and again, building that telemetry with different hypotheses, perhaps maybe the way to frame it. Can this move this person to a different project or different group? Are the same kind of organizational issues and dynamics happening there? What if the project was slimmed down? Like one of the things that, again, apologies for another sports metaphor, but one of the things that <laughs> coaches do in soccer and football for talented players that can't really grasp the speed of the game is they simplify it. They slow things down a lot. And so that's another tactic. We can put them on a simpler project where the scope is clearly defined, different context, different set of outcomes and deliverables and see what happens there. So again, part of it is me giving them one of three things, second chances, bottoming out, kind of like what is really going on here, seeking truth. The second bit is, can I be in proximity to them? Can I give them more of my resources and time? And then can I give them more support and resources? Are there other 
external factors that may be contributing this, do some investigating there. So it's just upon me as it is for either the candidate or the designer that's, that's on the team to help coach them up and find the systems and structures that aren't working for them and try and improve those, set them up for success. Cool. So yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Mixpanel and some of Mixpanel's reputation in the design industry for those who might not be familiar with it, but tell us a little bit about Mixpanel, what it is, how it runs. Yeah. Mixpanel, it is a product analytics company. So if you're a builder, if you have a website, mobile app, web app, and you want to understand your customer behavior at scale, Mixpanel is your best bet. It's super easy. You know, we're trying to help brands understand their data without needing any kind of statistic background, no analytics degree required. It's for people like in product and engineering and design who don't have and don't know SQL. You can go in and get insights pretty quickly. So it's a low code, easy visual way to kind of understand what's happening and bring quantitative data into your decision-making, regardless of what you are as regardless of your team structure or composition. So I'll use team in air quotes. Who do we serve? We serve primarily the startup and SMB. We love enterprise customers. We love it when large companies use mixed panel, but we love it when product teams use mixed panel to understand like if their new feature is successful or not. So we want them to find the source of truth. We want product teams to build the right thing, know if they're building the right thing, and then and continue to use mixed panel to enhance that. Nice. How did you find mixed panel? And how did you know it was a good fit for you? So that's a great story, Seth. I initially used Mixpanel way back at Trinkite in 2016. And we were looking at like segments or something like that. No, we were looking at, I think this is back when they had the A-B testing feature for like in-product messages or messaging or something like that. Weird feature, not analytics, but we were looking at that. And I was turned on by it their data visualizations. I thought they did them really, really well. They looked great. They made sense to me, very usable, best practices. I went on to build and lead teams on different dashboards and analytics products. And we'd always look back to Mixpanel as a source of inspiration. These, this team does dashboarding and data visualization really, really well. Check out their website, check out their product, check out their design system. Hey, here's a link, check this out. Fast forward six years later, and they're looking for someone to lead the product design team. And I thought, wow, what a great fit. Been a fanboy for so long. Now I get to be part of the company and lead this team that's doing such great work. So yeah, that's kind of my story and how I landed there. Nice. Maybe you can give us a little insight into like how a design team works or product team works at, at such a large kind of design first company. Sure. So it, surprisingly, we're not too, too big. How many, probably like a teenage years in maturity, medium sized design team. Alex is our head of design, design director, and we've got two equally sized groups. We've got brand design and we've got product design. My counterpart, Mike, manages the brand design. And we're 20 total. So in a company that's around 425, 450 employees. Wow. So it's, I guess it's an average size design team, but I think what makes us distinct is we do have brand and product under one roof. We are extending that now to include research, user research, we cracked open a research function in 2022. If you're excited about that. And we're going to expand our kind of design systems, design operations, and that role and scope in something more of a platform team. And so Mark Johnson, our design system extraordinaire, our minister of culture, he's going to be expanding that kind of function to more of a platform gig. So. Wow. So what is like, what does a day in the life of a mixed panel designer look like? Yeah. I mean, and I encourage anyone who's interested, please, please reach out to me. I'm happy to share our videos and our Figma docs that kind of give you a day in the life. We usually crack things open on Mondays with like a team tea and they're really silly. Like, you know, everything from what you do last weekend to the gift prompt, which is really fun. I think one of the last ones we did was, oh, what's one one object you'd put in a time capsule? And so it's everything from like slinkies to super soakers to, you know, music. And it's you have to answer the prompt in a GIF. And so we all get nice. on a Zoom call and we just go around the room and do that. 
<laughs> so it's a nice little warm up, you know, inspiration kind of keeps the culture and keeps the vibe really nice and chill. And then, you know, what we'll do during the week is, you know, we're trying to lean into asynchronous more. So we'll do stand ups and things like that async. Of course, we've got the design critique on Thursdays. That's our lifeblood of the team. We want to make sure that we continue to keep the quality high. And I feel like that's a very critical piece to how we keep that bar high is, well, bring in great people and great designers to do really great work, make really good decisions. But their proclivity to to share and be transparent, be open, and kind of embody that value for our company is, is really key. We have what's called bud time really fun where that's kind of like overtime for critique. So if you're dealing with a pretty unique problem and you want to kind of break out and pair, it's a way to kind of go deep on an hour, hour and a half on a Tuesday or Friday, just jam. And that's been really, really fun too. Those are more ad hoc. Those are just placeholders. Design critique is by far like our most critical kind of meeting, but blood times where we kind of develop these cross group partnership and collaborations that normally wouldn't happen all the more important in a remote world where you know leaders and managers like struggle with visibility and sharing we need to create these like structures and rituals in place that don't let designers kind of solve things in the vacuum yeah so pairing like that has been really helpful that's cool can you maybe take us through a little bit of kind of the structure of your design critiques and kind of what's in bounds, what's out of bounds, how do you run those? How do you, you know, measure the success of those? So they're one hour on Thursdays, kind of just operational logistics. You know, what we'll do is we'll do a Slack message or a prompt beforehand. Anyone got anyone to share? Usually we'll set that up. There are two 30 minute slots. We've seen them go 45, even the entire hour, but it's usually two slots for that hour on Thursday. And part of me is going through stand up and maybe asking people if they want to share something on Thursday. We record them on grain. We have them transcribed and we have the videos and we have them kind of archived. So we have them archived by project. So if you work on a particular project, you can see kind of the iterations. And if you want to go back, it's really helpful for someone who may parachute on a new project to listen and review all the decisions that are there. So we just keep all that in notion in kind of a, a table. So we track, we track all those. We have some ground rules. I usually just start by doing a warm up, and then we'll kind of roll right into giving the floor to the designer. And we usually kind of set them up in two ways. They'll either open Fig Jam and kind of give them the state of the union. Kind of this is the problem we're solving. Here's why. Here's how customers are doing it now. Here's where we are in stage. So again, Mark Johnson, shout out. He has a great little template where you can just kind of drop in a symbol in Figma, and we can kind of work through like what stage it's at little checklist of kind of where this product is. Nice. And we do, we do a lot of our work in Fig Jam, honestly. You know, my job, I think my responsibility is like, how do we create, if we do a silent critique like this, can we create a space where no one person is kind of consuming all the oxygen in the room? If we kind of open it up silently, can we get the highest quality, the most constructive feedback possible? Creates other problems. Might have to meet with that designer afterwards to kind of sort through and prioritize it. But we like to do 15, 20 minutes to uh, silent critique and Fig Jam. Huge fans, huge fans of Figma's Wi-Fi hip hop. That's yes. definitely the soundtrack of choice. <laughs> yeah. So they'll kind of present what they have, let everyone for, you know, 15 minutes or so write out some notes as to what their thoughts, questions, critiques might be versus just, you know, saying it immediately after seeing it type of thing. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, they'll walk through the two structures, usually about 10 minutes of walkthrough demo setup, context setting. Then we'll usually jump right into commenting. We've combined commenting and clarifying questions kind of in the same bit, mostly because the team's already kind of jumping into fig jam and leaving comments, but instead of, writing a, a clarifying question in a comment, post it on the fig jam. It's better that we just raise a hand in zoom and answer that question verbally just so it doesn't get lost. Yeah. If it's in a comment or sticky on in fig jam. So, so people aren't a actually opening up their Figma files and just running through like design mockups. They're kind of putting preparation and maybe pulling screenshots into to fig jam or 
I know we're kind of getting into the weeds, but I'm, you've piqued my interest a bit. Yeah. It, you know, it depends on how they roll. Like we've given some degree of flexibility to the designer and how they want to, again, with the goal of getting, extracting the most insights. Yeah. Kind of the UI QA, if you will. We're not making product decisions here. This is just, are we leveraging the current systems that we have? Are we using the design system properly, et cetera? So this is just like UI, brand QA. So part of it is, you know, hey, we want to, yeah, it's, it's really, do you want to open Fig Jam and leave comments or do you want to just maybe copy and paste a few screens and Fig nice. Jam? Yeah, start leaving notes. It just, you know, maybe this is a feature request, Fig, if you're listening. <laughs> use voting a lot and we use commenting a lot, taking our critiques and we time box that. We do silent commenting, silent voting. We leverage a lot of the out of the box functionality in Fig Jam to get the real insights that we need. We might even cluster them, you know, kind of bring those notes together, but it's really kind of up to the designer to lead, which really takes the pressure off. I will just add this, that I think it's, it's also an opportunity giving it is feedback and receiving feedback. That's a muscle that can be developed. And one of the ways that we help develop that is by letting designers facilitate that session themselves. It's one of the ways we just rotate that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So yeah, a few more questions. I'm curious from a management perspective, you know, you've obviously managed a ton of people and you've probably been managed by a lot of people wondering if you have Brent's guide to what good managers do versus what bad managers do, or maybe red flags that you, that you wouldn't do for, you know, folks listening today that they could, you know, kind of help follow. Yeah. Boy, I'm still learning about this, Seth, and I've got a long way to go. That's a good attitude to have. Maybe that's number one on the list of being a good manager. <laughs> Surround yourself with other managers who are operating in similar kind of like altitudes and domains like that having a peer group, I think has really been helpful to me, whether that's been over a Slack community or maybe even engineering managers being a part of their cohort and learning from them. That's been really, really helpful. Well, I think there's a tendency, the common anxiety I, I see is when you're leading and things aren't going well you want to jump in and help solve it. And I think part of my job is to make it okay to fail and learn fast and to resist the urge to kind of jump in and to fill in the blank, where you call it micromanage or insert my direction, swoop and poop, whatever, you know, you know, everyone despises that. So just resist the urge to do that myself is always something I'm, I'm continuing to kind of learn and struggle with. So sure. I, you know, I want to create space where, Hey, here's the, here are the boundaries and the lanes. Here's the destination. Here's the goal. I leave it to you to solve this. You know, it's easy to say that as I'm telling myself this, I need to continually remind myself to embed this into like my practice today, because it, it's just a, a natural reality. If your job is to produce like high performing teams, you want them to succeed and do things well. You don't want them to see them go off a different direction or do a design piece that isn't as impactful or effective. And so you want to steer that you want to course correct. And I think the the learning bit for me is how do I do that over time in a way that doesn't create, create a lot of thrash and turn at the last minute. I want to be able to kind of create that space for you. So that the goal is to get this right over the long haul, not just in kind of temporal kind of project moment. Totally. I think one of the hard things for me when I've, manage projects and designers is, you know, you kind of always have in your mind what you think the solution might be or where you think it should go. Right. And you know, sometimes people come up with great ideas that are completely different than yours. Sometimes people come up with ideas that might be great. Maybe, maybe if we test them, but it's very, very different than what you originally thought. And sometimes you have to just be okay with like, yeah, like, wasn't what I would have done. I don't really, in fact, I don't really like it, but that might just be my, you know, my gut feeling or instinct that I don't have any real like design critique reason or product reason. It's just, it's very different from what I would have done. And, you know, sometimes being a good manager means you just got to let it ride and trust the the team and let their decision, let them have some autonomy over their decision to be able to bring that to fruition and, and see, see if it's got wings. Yeah, I think you're onto something, Seth. It's, you know, there's a lot of ways 
some tropes there, like let them be customer driven or be data driven in their decision making or be customer led or strong opinions weekly held. I mean, all these things fill in the blank with whatever kind of manager bus trend. I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, I want to believe in you and I want to trust you to do the good work because that's why I hired you. And so, you know, I kind of goes back to my approach on management, which is like, I just want you to continually be tinkering. I want you to make progress over perfection. So um, try it out. It comes from a place of humility. I think when you say, you know, I don't have all the answers. In fact, there's probably multiple solutions here and no one can say for certain which one or which project or direction or design solution is best. So let's make some progress here, not be perfect. Yep. Totally. What are some things that you look for in, you know, candidates or team members as you're interviewing that you, you know, look for as, as good qualities to fit your team and fit your company? Gosh, it's such a tough question. Mm, It's on paper. It's easy, but the devil's in the details and really pulling apart the particulars of a portfolio and storytelling of a candidate can be tricky. What I would say is important to me is outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. So because we're a product analytics company, we do have a bent on some of the metrics and quantitative outcomes of what we do, right? We want to know if the work that you're doing is making an impact, both anecdotally and from conversations and words from real people, but also is this at scale, is this doing the thing we want it to do? And so I really look for candidates who can, you know, it's kind of an extension beyond what I've seen is on a case study or portfolio, you may get to the bottom of a, of a case study and it'll say something like, what did I learn? I think that's important. It's important that you learn the process as a, as a vehicle for learning and shipping the thing as a vehicle for learning. But I also would love to know what the impact and the outcomes were for this project. And it could be, you know, I've seen an array of things like we helped our customer support team work better. We helped our product management team figure out that email was better versus like some in product thing. So it it could be, you know, it's not like we made the money, you know, we had, we increased our conversion rate or, you know, our ARR went up this. I mean, those are great. I mean, I'll probably have a lot of follow-up questions about that and how you directly contributed to that. But even, you know, I'm equally concerned about the impact you had on the process and the culture too. Very cool. So yeah, maybe, you know, kind of wrapping us up, you can give a few tips on, you know, kind of at scale, managing a large design team, how you can, you know, effectively nurture and build a good design team to, you know, not only just the hard skills of good design and leveling up, but kind of more of the culture of a design team and how to nurture and improve that over time. Oh man. Okay. So do we have 30 minutes? We, how about how about lightning round? Uh, we can, yes. I'll, I'll fire. We, okay. we can do the, the executive <laughs> summary. <laughs> Sounds good. You know, Peter Principle is a real thing. I mentioned this earlier. I'm probably going to butcher the definition here, but bear with me. Peter Principle, I think design is kind of ripe with this, where you, you rise to the ranks or you progress in your, your career and your skill set through your contribution. So you become an excellent designer. You can become an excellent engineer. You can become an excellent writer. Now where it happens, you've kind of tapped out, you've reached your maximum, your optimal kind of locally there. What do you do? Well, usually what happens is you're thrust into management. And what the Peter Principle says is what made you great as an IC does not make you great as a manager. It's, it's almost a completely different role. And so I think, you know, what I've benefited from is really the one or two people in communities around me that have shown me kind of what those strengths and weaknesses are. Like sometimes your best designer is not going to be your best manager. Right. And, or say like yourself, the best example is there's a sales leader and they hit all their quota. They hit quota every month, but you put them in a team or people management capacity and they fail. They're not good at leading people. And so high achievers in a contribution capacity does not necessarily equate to being a good people leader. And that's, I've had to summarize that. So how do you break through that? How do you get through that? Boy, dual tracks is great. I think organizations and teams that give people the option to go deep in their craft and not lead people 
you have to give them that option. I think we need to normalize individual contributor like principal ICs and senior principal and staff designers and make that okay. Leadership looks a lot different from them than it does like through teams and people. And then if you are going to identify someone who has people management potential, uh, one of the things that we're doing at Mixpanel is we have a concept of an M3 or a team lead. And what that really is, is they're trying us out. Is this good for them? And having an ability to kind of roll back into IC, this isn't a good fit. It's their choice, not ours. And I think that's one thing that organizations can do to really help emerging leaders is let them try it out, have create an environment where they can explore this in real time and really do it. Not just read it in a book or coming out of an annual review and saying, oh, hey, you know, you're, you've got potential here. Let's just give you five people. Have the resources and structures and kind of time box that where you can actually transition them into something like a people management or team lead. That'd be my advice. Nice. Love it. Well, Brad, this has been an awesome time. I appreciate all of your advice and hearing your story. This was a great chat and I appreciate you coming on and I will leave you with the last word. Oh, I said, I love this time together. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts and where my heart is. If you are considering going into management or maybe you're a principal designer and you want to stay a principal designer, you're at that crossroads. I would love to hear from you. Please send me a message on LinkedIn. I am Twitter sober and I'm Facebook sober. I'm not on those platforms, but you can certainly get a hold of me through my website or on LinkedIn. So please, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on the Product Design Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure and go follow our guests. Let them know they did a great job and you learned a lot. Um, more to come in the following weeks as we bring on new guests. Please hit that subscribe button so that you will get these podcasts uh, and learn a ton about the product design community. Excited to see you next time. Thanks.